Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to BibleQuest.tv, the Tuesday edition. We're glad you're able to join us today on this lovely Tuesday afternoon, where we talk about Bible topics and subjects and answer your questions. Uh, we're going to have some interesting uh, conversation today, as usual. The panelists will be bringing us some very interesting responses to some questions that we got in. Uh, if you're coming in on the, 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 the Zoom app, let me get that out. Um, be sure to ask your questions and, and text your questions in using the Q&A box. If you're coming in on uh, the YouTube channel, go ahead and put your comments in the, in the chat window there, the chat box. Jonathan, our webcast engineer, is with us again, and he'll be monitoring all of that as well as putting in some comments into the program. Good to see you, Jonathan. And how are you doing today? I'm doing really well. I have a uh, a different venue now. I'm uh, I upgraded from my old musty room into a full house that's empty this this for the next few months. So yeah, I like that artwork behind you. Well, it's interesting yeah. artwork. Let's put it that way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, Stephen, good to see you today. Coming from Harrisburg, how are you doing, Stephen? Doing well, Drew. How are you doing? Good, good, good. Welcome to the program today, Jeff, over in Exton. Jeff, good to see you. Hey, thanks, Drew. Good and, to be here. Good. And also Scott down in Gettysburg. How you doing, Scott? And Scott is there, but Scott is Sorry. There. I was muted. Sorry. Doing fine. <laughs> okay. All right. Good to see you, Scott. All right. So, fellas, uh, interesting topics today. We're going from, uh, let's see, what we call today's program. It's called uh, Sanctification to Separation. And what's the title in the middle? One of you guys came up with. Don't Hate Antichrist. <laughs> 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 and we're going to talk about today as a question. These questions came up from, from others. <laughs> All right, so where, where are we going with the first one, Scott? It's about a different, let me read that question. Unless, Stephen, you have that question up? Yeah, so the first question we got today uh, says, what are the f different types of sanctifications and their biblical references? And this comes from a listener who I believe their first language is French. So one of the key texts in a minute we'll put up on the screen in French. But before we do that, let's do a little bit of word definition because uh, people get different ideas in their mind about what sanctification is, and we'll be discussing some of that. We want to find our answers in the Bible. But one of the things that's confusing, uh, perhaps in English, you don't realize all the words that are related in English, and you often do in other languages. Like in the Czech Bible, all of the words in this family are svata. Uh, and so you can see the relation to them. In English, we've got words that are spelled very differently that we don't realize are all the same word groups. So let's talk about that word group a little bit as we introduce what it is, and then we'll look specifically what the Bible says about sanctification. So, uh, Jeff, you're our Greek guy, go-to guy here. Uh, tell us a little bit about the word group from which sanctification comes. Well, so in the New Testament, you have the Greek word hagias, which can be translated holy. Um, in the plural, holy ones, it's an adjective, but when it's used of holy ones, it's functioning as a noun, really. And so sometimes we translate it saint. And so you have, you've got the H group of words, holy, holiness, hallow, which would be the verb to make holy. And, then, and those would be from the Anglo-Saxon roots. And that's why we have in English this situation. We have a whole bunch of words that come from the Anglo-Saxon or Germanic roots, and then we have other words that mean the same thing that come from Latin. And so then from Latin, you have the verbs sanctify instead of hallow, and saint for holy one, and sanctification for holiness. So basically, uh, you've got in Greek this these words, hagias, hagiasuno, or hagiasune, uh, hagiazo, uh, all having this hagia stem, and then in English, we have a bunch of H words and S words. Uh, the H words, holy, hallow, holiness. The S words, saint, sanctification, uh, sanctify. 
that kind of thing. But they all have this basic idea of setting something apart from something and to something. Yeah. So like in English, farm, farmer, farming, farm, you know, it's, it's all the one root word and you see the connection. <clears throat> Not as easy to see in English, but it's there in the Greek. Stephen, I imagine Spanish is the same way. Are those words more obviously bunched together in Spanish? They are. I mean, santo is the word for holy and santificación. Uh, so they have like the S-A-N. Um, and you even see that in like in, in cities here. San Francisco is St. Francis. Oh, there you go. Uh, things like that. So you'll see the S-A-N is more common in the Spanish across the board. And so it would almost be like saying sanctified Francis. Mm -hmm. whether Francis was sanctified or not. All right, so with that, understanding a little bit about the word, what does the Bible teach about sanctification? Well, it's a good thing if we are sanctified from sin unto God. So basically, you've got this idea of being set apart. I, I just want to call attention to a passage, um, and you know, I hope, I hope I'm thinking right. Uh, Acts chapter... 20, it just comes to mind here, and I didn't look it up. Um, so if I'm going down a, a rabbit hole here, a ra or if I'm going down, a, if this is a wild goose chase, when do you guys be ready to bail me out? All right, we'll, we'll, have, we'll suddenly have technical difficulties if we need to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see that the passage is not what I was thinking. So Our I'll try to stand by goose. for technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just want to make this observation then. There is a concept of being set apart from sin, but also unto God. Uh, when something is set aside, we, and sometimes when we read the word consecrated in the Old Testament, it's consecrated to God, it's devoted to God. It, it, it's thus sanctified. But it's also the idea of being set apart from sin. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, you have Paul talking about sanctification. He says, this is your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication. So if I'm going to be holy and set apart to God, I can't be involved in fornication. So I have to be set apart from sin to be set apart unto God. In fact, let's uh, go and read that verse. If you didn't catch the reference, that was in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Mm -hmm. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, verse 1 says, Finally then, brethren, we beseech you, and exhort you in the Lord that as you received of us, how you ought to walk to please God, even as you do walk, that you abound more and more. For you know what charge we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication. So this is a pagan city, a heathen city. People tended to live in fornication, but if they were going to be Christians, they needed to be set apart from sin, set apart to God, they needed to live holy lives, sanctified lives, and abstain from that. Romans 6 is another passage that I think has a similar idea. In verse 13, he's saying, don't present your members unto sin as instruments of unrighteousness. Don't use your body for bad things, but present yourselves unto God as alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And then you follow that idea down through the text, and you get to verse 19, and he says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. I'm, I'm using worldly illustrations to illustrate the point here. Um, but then he says, for as you presented your members as servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto, uh, unto iniquity, talking about before you became Christians, that's the way you live. Even so, now present your members as servants to righteousness unto sanctification. So here you're going to use your body for good things in accordance with God's word, and thus you're presenting them unto sanctification. So this sounds like the, the, both these uh, references you're giving is something of an operation of us carrying out our will, our doing something. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 talks about following after peace and the sanctification without which no man shall see the Lord. So the Bible does talk about our obligation to live in a certain way to be sanctified. On the other hand, the Bible also talks about God sanctifying us. Yeah, and as we think about this idea of being sanctified and being a saint, sometimes you hear people say, oh, oh, well, I'm no saint. Um, and when people say something like that, 
I don't know if they realize what they're saying because they're saying like, oh, I'm not perfect. But that being a saint is something that every Christian should desire to be. It means you're holy. And God said, First Peter 1, you shall be holy for I am holy in all your behavior. That, that's uh, really important. Very, As you're talking very, about this. Sorry, a very common statement. Jimmy Carter famously said it uh, back when he was running for president. Um, uh, this was in the news. I didn't get the magazine. This was just reported in the news. Uh, he did an interview with Playboy magazine, and he was famous for being a Sunday school teacher and uh, went to the back church and everything. But he clarified in that interview, he said, I'm a, I'm a born again, or I'm a, but I'm no saint. And there you see that. that this, yeah. yeah, it's not a valid Bible distinction at all. So, so here's the problem. God says, you shall be holy for I am holy. It's a, it's a statement found in the Old Testament, but it's quoted in First Peter, the first chapter, and uh, verse 16. You shall be holy, for I am holy. The idea is God is separated from sin, and his people must also be separated from sin. Yeah. The problem is we can say, okay, I'm going to avoid committing fornication, and I'm going to try to do things that are right. I'm going to avoid other sins, but I cannot make myself separated from sin so that I am unblemished and thus acceptable to God. And so the Bible not only speaks about my responsibility to live in a sanctified manner, but it also talks about the fact that God is the one who sanctifies us and makes us holy. And I'll call your attention to Hebrews chapter 10 here, where it says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse, um, uh, verse, Oh, where is it here? Uh, verse 14. Well, I'll start in verse 12. He, when he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, henceforth expecting till his enemies be made the footstool of his feet, for by one offering, meaning the sacrifice of Jesus, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. If you back up to verse 10, it says, by which will, the will of Jesus in doing the will of the Father, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So I, I need, I have an obligation to follow after sanctification, but I cannot make myself so separated from sin that I'm going to be acceptable to God. It requires the sacrifice of Jesus to sanctify. Me. Yeah. I have an illustration <laughs> for that, but first, Stephen, uh, I think I cut you off. Did you have another comment a minute ago? Did you oh, no, that's fine. Carry on. All right. So let's suppose you are going to make a stone fireplace or something in your house and you want some really beautiful, some nice stones for that. You go out in a field and you're going to get some stone. Now they're all covered with filth and dirt, right? So out of all these filthy, dirty stones, you take some stones and you clean them up and you set them apart to be used now for a purpose other than just laying around in dirt. And that's what God does. He sanctifies us and sets us for his purpose. Egg whites. So the basic idea of, of sanctification is separation. But what we're saying is it's not just separating from something, it's separating unto something for a purpose. When you separate egg whites from the yolks to make meringue for a pie, um, I don't know how often you guys make meringue pies, but uh, when, when you do that, <laughs> you're separating the whites from the yolks, but you're not gonna, that's not going to be useful to you unless you actually then use those whites to make your meringue separated from the yolks onto this meringue pie. All right. So I want to put it, well, before I put this first up, let's address a common misconception. So I'm studying with a friend right now, and he mentioned the other day, he said, first you get justified, and then later on, you get sanctified. And this is, whether he realizes it or not, it's not something from Scripture, but it originally goes back to the theology of, of the, the Wesleyan brothers, uh, who were Anglicans, they were in the Church of England, and to set this up, let's just stop and think about what the Church of England was like uh, a few hundred years ago. 
So if you've seen a movie, say about England in the 1700s, uh, as you watch that movie, if it's a somewhat accurate depiction, would you say that everybody in that movie is behaving wholly? No. 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 But probably everybody in that movie would have been a member of the Church of England. Yes. They would have been christened as a baby. It, it was a, it, Catholicism had kind of been a state religion when King Henry VIII, you know, just <laughs> from that and made himself the head instead of the Pope. Uh, for the reasons he wanted to do that. It still continued as kind of a state religion. So people would be christened as a baby. They would be a member of the Church of England, by and large. And then an uh, Anglican official would preside over their burial. But people were not holy. In the Wesleyan, Charles and John talked about ho holiness and being holy. And they taught that there was a first work of grace and a second work of grace. What were those two works of grace? Well, the first one they taught was justification. You're made, you're made right with God by the blood of Jesus Christ. And then the second one was the practical sanctification or living a life of holiness. So you could look around at all these unholy people, Chris and Anglicans, and you might think they're justified, but they're clearly not sanctified. And so they talked about you need to wait for this second work of grace, which eventually leads to the for instance, the holiness movement, which comes out of that, see, not just justified, but sanctified, and then the looking for, how can I tell whether or not I got that second work of grace? How can I tell whether or not I got sanctified? And so about a hundred and a little over 115 years ago or so in California, you had the beginnings of kind of the Pentecostal uh, movement where, okay, tongues, that, that's when you get that, that shows that you were sanctified. Um, well, we've already looked at Hebrews 12, and what's very pertinent in that passage relating to this concept that we just described? Well, there seems to be some effort on our part. Uh, let's read that verse again, Hebrews chapter 12, um, where he said in verse 14, Hebrews 12, verse 14, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness or sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. So he's talking about striving for two things. One is for peace with everyone, and the other is for this necessary holiness or sanctification without which we're not going to see God. Yeah. And so there's some obligation on us, and it's necessary. So according to Hebrews 12, so according to Wesleyan theology, can you be right with God, but not sanctified? Yes. But according to Hebrews 12, you, you can't see God without sanctification. Exactly. Uh, so let's put up here on the screen, uh, we're going to put it up first off in English. And you'll notice here, this will illustrate what Jeff was describing before. Some translations will translate it holiness, others sanctification. King James. Follow after holiness without, can everybody see my screen? Yep. Okay. Follow holiness without which no man will see the Lord. New King James similarly. Um, and then ESV, holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Uh, and then we've got New American Standard, sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. American Standard, standard sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. And if we look at it in French, uh, if we can. You've got it there, if you click on it. Yeah, there you click on the tab. tab. Yeah, it, ah, it keeps on mine. When I go up there, something else comes there. Let me see if I can move my thing just a little bit. There we go. I'm not going to try to pronounce that, but this is Hebrews 12, 4, I'll spare everybody. <laughs> uh, but this is in French, and it's without what? Sanctification, you cannot see the Lord. Jeff, why are you putting that up in French? Because the question that came in was from someone who asked it in French. So I just wanted to make that clear while we're using French. So the idea of, of sanctification um whether it's something that comes later or not. That's, I think that's effective, what we've just shown there. But 
But also think of this. You know, we, we saw in Hebrews chapter uh, 10 and verse 12, the idea that we are sanctified by the offering of, of Christ. Uh, not verse 12, it's chapter 10 and verse uh, 10, by which will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That's the same thing that justifies us. Well, it also sanctifies us. Um, and you think of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, yeah. and in verse uh, 11, after he talks about those who will not inherit the kingdom of heaven, he says, such were some of you, fornicators, adulterers, and so on. Such were some of you, but you were washed, uh, you were sanctified, and you were justified. And th there's an interesting distinction to be made here. Very literally, this could be translated. You got yourselves washed, baptized. You were justified. You were sanctified. That's passive, and it's past tense in, in the same, by the same token whereby they were um, justified, they were sanctified, and it's by the offering of Jesus Christ. And yet, we have an obligation to grow in our sanctification, to pursue sanctification. So it's an ongoing process. We stand separated from sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. At the moment we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we stand separated from sin, righteous in the eyes of God, set apart from sin unto God, and that's sanctification. But we have an obligation then to walk in sanctification, to pursue sanctification, and to grow in sanctification. And if you think about it, the same thing can really be said about justification. In, in Romans, Paul argues that Abraham is our example of justification or righteousness. And righteousness or justification was credited to him uh, because of his faith. It, but that's something that we see on various occasions throughout his life. It, it, we see it when God said that uh, he would have a son. He believed God, and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. It's said in connection with when he was willing to offer that son some years later on, Isaac. And he, he believed God, and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. Um, and so, so, yes, there is a sense in which... The one who is a Christian continues pursuing sanctification and growing in sanctification. Uh, but he is sanctified at the same time he's justified by the same thing, the sacrifice of Jesus. Let's touch on a couple more points and move to our next question. But one I'd like to just touch on is this. Within the holiness movement, there came the idea to some people that once you're sanctified, you never sin again. So like you get justified. Okay. So Joe got saved. He got justified. A few years later, Joe got sanctified. Now he will never commit another sin the rest of his life. Uh, God had made him, you know, impervious to being able to sin. Uh, uh, and along with that, we <laughs> got that second work of grace. So a lot of people were saved, but man, if you got that tongue and showed that you were among the sanctified, this was more spiritually mature. How does that fit with what we see in the Corinthian letter? Well, they're definitely speaking in tongues, and they're not living sanctified lives. If you read First Corinthians, uh, you got a problem there. Yeah, and so it wasn't necessarily mature, and you can revert. And some of them have reverted back to acting like Corinthians. Jonathan. And, and that's uh, the, the passage that, that uh, Jeff brought up in, in 1 Corinthians 6. That's actually, that's not the first time that they were called uh, sanctified or saints. It was in the very beginning of the letter. So in, the beginning, in chapter 1, he says to the churches of God that are in Corinth, uh, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, uh, called to be saints together in verse 2 of chapter 1. And then the very next thing that he says is, why am I hearing about these divisions <laughs> against uh, in your church? Why are you suing each other? Why is there a, a man in your church that is sleeping with his father's wife and, and so on and so forth? So obviously those yeah. who are sanctified can sin still. And he says, cast them out, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. He says, don't be deceived. If you're practicing these things, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. And they needed to get back to appreciating and focusing on that justification and sanctification they've been given. Anything further on that before we move to our next question? Next question. That's a good segue into the next question. 
silence. How can we be expected to hate someone who is an or antichrist? To, to, not, to not hate someone. How can we expect it to, I'm sorry, good. I missed that word, and that's key. How can we expect to not hate someone who's an antichrist? And this came up recently. Mike, Mike had brought this up recently. <coughs> First off, somebody defined antichrist for us. Well, you know, if we told the truth, some of us would, uh, we'd have to say we were antichrist at one point. Yeah, John, in, in First John, he said, John, I don't have the verse in front of me, but John said that anyone who denies that Christ came in the flesh, someone who denies that Christ is the Son of God, that would be the end of Christ, right? Yeah, in fact, there's only a few references to Antichrist by that term in Scripture, and all of them are in First and Second John. Mm -hmm. You ask most people, where can you read the word Antichrist in the Bible? Everybody assumes it would be Revelation. Revelation. Not there. Yeah. So, so let's just read and then it. they say Second Thessalonians. Not there. Right. So, um, First John two, verse eighteen. Uh, even as you've heard that Antichrist cometh, even now there have arisen many Antichrists. So let's let's just touch on this as we go through. If you ask the average person who's you know goes to church somewhere and's heard of the Antichrist, they would tend to say the Antichrist is past or future. Future, future. and a unique individual, one one person, one person in the future that's going to be a world leader. Mm -hmm. uh, if we look at these ver verses, it says even now, back then, have there arisen many antichrists. Uh, and then what's our next reference down a few verses? Somebody read that one for us. Down in verse 22, it says, Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. And then chapter 4, verse 3. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming. And now is in the world already. And then our last reference in the New Testament to, with the phrase Antichrist, 2 John 7. For many deceivers are gone forth into the world, even they that confess not that Jesus Christ comes in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the Antichrist. And it says many of them. Yeah. And there were Gnostics that taught that Jesus didn't have a human physical body. All right. So, well... Should we love those people or hate them? Well, you know, God commendeth his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So here we were in a state of rebellion against God, and God loved us and sent his son to die for us. Yeah. If there's a not just, not just while we were sinners, there's that, but also while we were enemies. Yeah. Yeah. Enemies and, and opponents, yeah. So love doesn't mean endorse. Right. Love doesn't mean uh, never say anything negative about. Uh, love Love means you're going to act in a good way toward do what is good for them. So there's yeah. an ind individual who's an antichrist. What's the most loving thing that I can do for that individual? Does love mean like? No. Oh. They, oh. Yeah, that's... And... and, and for instance, when Jesus said in Matthew 5, he said, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, which was not what Leviticus 19 said. Mm -hmm. But Jesus said, I tell you, love your enemy. And a lot of people have trouble with that because they think, how can you? Jesus didn't say like your enemy. He yeah. said, love your enemy. What's the difference? Like, like is just, I, I feel happy is spending time with them. It's just so much fun to... To, to go fishing with them or play cards with them or what I sure like them. Yeah. <laughs> You're probably not going to like going fishing with the guy who's trying to shoot you, you and him in a fishing boat. Together. And Steven is being stoned. Is he thinking, Oh, what a fun afternoon with these best buddies of mine. Like is oh, more superficial. Why didn't I hang around with them earlier and get stoned earlier. <laughs> As he died, what did he say? The Lord, well, do not hold this sin against their souls. And if on at least one of those individuals, that will be fulfilled. Who would that be? Yeah. Saul of Tarsus. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. He'll be forgiven. So how happy would Stephen be to then find 
uh, 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 Paul with him in eternal life. So yeah. not because he had so much fun being around him or liked being around him, but because he cared about him and loved him. And yeah, so, so Stephen's not going to see Paul in, in heaven and say, oh, God, I can't stand him being here. Get rid of him. He's delighted that Paul is there, and he'd be delighted if every other one of the individuals who were stoning him were forgiven of their sins through the blood of Jesus Christ, cleansed, and thus could spend eternity with God with Stephen. Uh, and so you can love the Antichrist. Many times we think, and this is true uh, in, in marriage and stuff, or, or when people are picking out a spouse, many times people think that love is what you get. Let me just illustrate this way. If you ask a young man, if a young man comes to you and he says, oh, I'm in love, I'm in love, I'm in love. If, and you know, I proposed to her, she said, yes, oh, I'm so in love. If you say, what do you love about her? What's she going to start saying? The way she cooks? Yeah, he loves the way she cooks. He loves the way she looks. He loves the way she talks. He loves the way she walks. He loves the way she does her hair, laughs at his jokes. All of those are about what he gets. And now, what if she is in an accident and she gets paralyzed and has some brain damage and has her skin burned? She can't cook the same. She can't walk the same. She can't maybe talk the same. She doesn't look the same. Do you still love her? John 3.16 tells us something about love. God so <coughs> loved the love world. that he gave. gave. Love is not just about, it's not about, so if, if, you, if your neighbor is against Christ, you should love him. Not because, oh, he gives me such a warm feeling, but because you're trying to take something from him but you're trying to give something to him. You want to give him the gospel. So back then to your point about stoning and being able to love somebody who's stoning and then your application about this girl that you might want to marry or something. If a girl is trying to stone you to death, that would be a good world girl to pick out as a wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, one other point on this uh, about what love does when we're talking about loving those who are anti-Christ. Um, that's certainly what Jesus himself did when he was being crucified, I'd say the people crucifying him were anti-Christ. And he says, Father, forgive them. Uh, and also in Mark 10, uh, with the rich young man who comes to Jesus and says, I've kept all these commandments since my youth. Uh, he said, uh, in Mark 10, verse 21, Mark 10, 21, and Jesus looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. That's an important passage because it, it demonstrates you can challenge someone, you can tell somebody what they do not want to hear in love. doesn't mean you tell them in a way tr trying to drive them away. Jesus was trying to tell him what he needed to hear. But sometimes yeah. people think that love means you just, you just placate. You just tell them what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. As in Ephesians 4, you know, speaking the truth in love. And that's, of course, if someone's anti-Christ, we need to love them. Part of loving them is telling them the truth that you need to repent and you need to turn around. Um, so it's, again, it's not saying that we just love going fishing with them. Um, but it's also also saying that we just don't do anything. Uh, we need to out of love for them, seek to turn them to Christ. Very good. All right. Anything else on that? We'll go to our third question. What is our third question? That's a good question. <laughs> Oh, now we have a fourth. Uh, all right, here we go. The third question is, uh, and I'm paraphrasing it based on the question when it was asked to me. It says, the Lord, the, the Lord is losing many of his young followers to the world around them once they leave home and go off to college uh, at a fairly higher rate today than just a generation ago. Is there any merit in the concept we see among religious groups like Amish or Mennonites? in uh, secluding or restricting our community. Uh, from what I understand, they maintain an 85% retention rate. Thanks, Rod, good question. Well, let's start with some biblical texts and principles, and then we'll uh, move over and take a look at the Amish question. What would be some biblical texts and principles? Related? It's notable that on the night that Jesus is betrayed, he prays for his disciples and for, for us, the disciples in the future. 
And one of the things that he says specifically in there, um, he says that he's praying for this, but not for that. Uh, let me find it here. It's in John chapter 17. Uh, look at what it says here. Um, verse 14, John 17, 14. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So Jesus is very clear that he does not want his disciples to be of the world. They're not going to be of the world, and therefore the world is going to hate them. There's going to be a persecution that happens. But he clarifies in verse 15, I do not ask that you take them out of the world. The disciples are to be in the world, but not of the world. Very good. And in 1 Corinthians 5, there's something kind of related to that. There's a brother in the church there who's living after the world, and he's, he's having an affair with his father's wife. And Paul's pointing out that they need to uh, deliver him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Uh, he has to repent if he's going to be let back in. He needs to be put away. He says, I wrote to you not to keep company if any man that's named a brother be a fornicator or drunkard, etc. But then he said something very much related to what you just said about people in the world. What did he say there in First Corinthians 5? He said, I'm not talking about fornicators and adulterers and drunkards in the world. Right. Otherwise, you'd have to go out of the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so let's think about this, a monastery, suppose we build a monastery, <coughs> put high walls around it, and we put disciples inside the monastery so that they never see an adulterer, they never, you know, smell a drunkard, they, they never get stoned from by a thief, they're all protected there, and they will never see the world. What's the problem? world's not going to see them either. It'll be affected by them, influenced for good. <laughs> yeah. Matthew 5, we're charged to be what to the world? Light, light of the world. Yeah. And if you hide the light. It's no good. It's like putting a lamp under a basket. What's the uh, point? Right. So we're going to have associations in the world, but does that mean we shouldn't be careful about those associations? Oh, absolutely. In 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even though we see in Acts 19, Paul <laughs> had friends who were pagan officials in the city of Beverly. Some of the Asiarchs were Paul's friends. But you suppose they were his closest friends? No, not at all. So we're going to be in the world we need to be able to be friends with people in the world. We need to be a light to the world. But if we make our closest associates people of the world, is that going to be good? No. Well, we look at Jesus. Uh, I mean, he came into the world. Uh, he's God. He's holy. He, he comes into, he dwelt among us. And he ate with tax collectors and sinners. And, of course, the Pharisees are mad about that because they had this false self-righteousness that involved not even – messing with them. And no, Jesus went to the people who needed help, but he's not off in the brothels and the bars and places like that. He's with people who need to hear the truth. He's not approving of what they're doing, but he's calling them to holiness. He says, it's not the well that need a doctor. It's the sick that need a doctor. But his closest friends are people who are seeking the Lord. Uh, his 12 disciples, uh, you know, those people that he really spends time with are people who are he, that he's working with and who are, are on board with his mission. So let, let's back up a, a step here just for a moment and, and say this. When we start talking about young people falling away and that kind of thing, uh, kind of a premise to that question is, there, is there anything you can do about that to prevent that from happening? And, and maybe let's establish that parents do have um, the opportunity and the responsibility to raise their children in such a way that it, it, I won't say determines as if the children have no will, but that it, it influences the direction they're going to go. And, yes. and, and let me start with this passage and then I'll take it somewhere. But, and you guys may not agree with me about what this passage means. There is some discussion about what it means. 
Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Um, I, I, I'm inclined to think that the traditional understanding of that is the correct understanding. That is not just train him up in whatever he's inclined to do, but right. train him in the way he ought to go. And yes. that has some bearing on what direction he's going to go. It's a truism. Yes. It's a proverb. Okay. All right. So then if, if we acknowledge that, and then we think, okay, so I as a parent have something to say about the direction my child ends up going. And I think about the fact that people generally, and children especially, naturally uh, try to be like their peer group, try to fit in. That's just a fact of human nature. And if I understand that's a fact of human nature and I'm raising my child, then what I, what I want to do is, is have some influence on who, my, who, who it is my child considers his peer group. Yes. And, and I'm going to start, I'm going to start with this family. There is the concept. I know so-and-so may do this, so-and-so, but in this family, we're not going to do that. And it's kind of the Joshua statement. As for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Right. So I think it's important for godly parents to establish this concept of here's our family and our identity is serving the Lord. Ultimately, the family itself is not the identity. The, the identity is Jesus Christ. You want to be like Jesus Christ. But along the way, part of getting there then is making sure that in your child's life, just people, children his age of the world who do all kinds of ungodly things and talk in all kinds of ungodly ways are not the peer group with him whom he identifies. He may have interaction with them. He may be a good example to them. He may try to influence them, but you should raise your child in such a way he does not think of himself as one of them. He thinks of himself right. as, as, as being identified with people who are trying to serve God. And being a light to the world or yeah. those ones who are in darkness. Yeah. yeah. But that doesn't guarantee anything because the child does grow up. I grow up. We grow up. And then we end up making our own decisions in spite of all of the influence and the positive influence we're going to have. So it still comes down to the individual after he's an adult, right? Sure. It's accountable. But there is a truism there. Truisms don't mean you can never find an exception. Easy, one easy way to illustrate it is Proverbs 15.1. What is it that turns away wrath? What kind of answer? self answer. Yeah. And what kind of words stir up anger? Harsh word. Yeah. Has there ever been a time that a harsh word has stilled everything and arguments stopped? Yeah. Sometimes. Has there ever been a time, especially if you're dealing with a drunk, an angry drunk, where a soft answer didn't turn away his right? Right. It, yes, there have been such times, but that's wow. the exception. Yeah. It's the exception, not the rule. The rule being, if you train them, and by the way, there, train them up. It doesn't say if you control them, they'll stick with it. Because if all you do is control them, they're, they're going to be the child says, I can't wait till I'm 18. If you train them up in the way they should go so that it becomes part of their self-culture, then they'll, as a rule, do that. I think the same point that you're making, just take the flip side of it. If you train your child up in the way he should not go, you raised your child to drink, do drugs and drink and curse and, and steal and all of that. Is there the possibility he'll end up serving God? Yeah, there's the possibility, but probably he's going to go the other way. Right. <laughs> that's that's right. the, what we're saying is it, you have an effect on your child, have a good effect. Jonathan. And that, that word, uh, uh, it was brought up to me one time, and I didn't know this that word in Proverbs 22, um, uh, the word for train up your child, it's actually. Um, translated elsewhere in the Old Testament as dedicate. And it's the same word that's used um, whenever Solomon was dedicating the temple after he built it to the Lord. And now we're back to um, consecration and sanctification. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah, and and so the so the the point the point is uh, what what you do is is building the foundation. I think the question asked was, um, well, why are there so many young people that follow when they go off to college? Um, was that a part of the question, Drew? Just yeah. That, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Or, or when they um, leave and, and home where, or go to college, right? Yeah, yeah, when they leave home. And and that's where um, a, a lot of your faith is is shaken. And I think what it comes down to, why do so many young people fall away? 
um, at that time in their life, it's because that's when they're on their own and they don't have this structured thing of where they're feeding off of their parents' faith or their, or the church's faith or that kind of thing. Now it becomes their own. And when Jesus um, describes the four different kinds of, of hearts, the four different kinds of soil in Matthew 13, um, three of the four types of soil uh, or types of hearts are those that have the word, they, they hear, it, they know about God, they understand the or they hear the word, but they don't accept it. So one just doesn't accept it at all. One receives it and then immediately wilts whenever there's some kind of hard thing. One receives it and then is choked out by the cares of the world. But the, the rarer one is the type that receives it understands it and then bears fruit and why a lot of young people fall away when they leave home is because they haven't been bearing fruit while they're at home and so they get to college or they get to their their own life and they're still not bearing fruit and the trials come and choke them out they didn't have deep roots and there were too many rocks in their garden uh we got our time's up let's take about half a minute and just tie it in with the, the amish part uh i think a lot of us know you know there's a lot of very nice Amish people. There's something very attractive about the lifestyle, et cetera. But the, if, when we're talking about the gospel, that's not what we need to aim for uh, because it's that we need to have our children trained with allegiance to Christ. And Jeff, if you'll just maybe just very briefly relate, you uh, knew an Amish fellow, I believe, that was removed put out of the Amish church, and if you'd share with the audience what he was put out of the Amish church for, and how that would kind of indicate to us the solution is not to like simply become Amish culture or something. I'm, I'm not, you may be referring to, uh, if, I, if I know who you're thinking of. Uh, the little guy that the BBC did. The, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so uh, he was put out of the Amish church basically because he was wanting to have Bible studies with people who were not Amish, and he was talking about salvation by grace. But one of the things he was stressing was, you have all these traditions, and the Amish don't necessarily say that having a car is sin, but if you get a car, you are violating the uh, traditions of the Amish. You are rebelling against their overseers, their bishops. And so really the point that I would make, and what he was understanding was the Amish dedication to that way of life is is a dedication to that way of life that culture more than it is to god and so when we talk about whether they're losing their children or not if 85 percent of their children remain amish all we're really saying is 85 percent of their children want to stick with the culture in which they were raised right and so what, what we're interested in is not just a culture we're interested in encouraging our children to be true to the lord very good all right, guys, I think that covers everything for today. I want to thank everyone and your participation. I thank you for asking those questions. We want to invite you again next Tuesday when we join the uh, webcast airways again at 2 o'clock. Um, any other thoughts before we sign off, guys? The silence tells me none. Good seeing you all. <laughs> we'll take care again. Bye-bye.